January 27th, 2021 City Council meeting. Uh, would everyone please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Council Member Hutchings. We'll come back to her. Council Member Ruffridge. Present. Pamela Parker. Here. Carey. Present. Tilson. Present. Lisa Parker. Present. Hutchings. I have to unmute Council Member Hutchings. We see the visual. Student Representative Cox. Present. You have a quorum. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the agenda and consent agenda? I'll so move the agenda as presented. Thank you, Mr. Cholson. There's a second. Is there a second? I second as mayor. We thank mean. you. Thank you, Vice Mayor Parker. Would the clerk please read the consent? Or excuse me, are there any changes to the agenda or consent agenda? Seeing none, would the uh, clerk please read the consent agenda? Approval of the January 13th, 2021 council meeting minutes, new business ordinances, ordinance 2021, amending Soldotna Municipal Code 17.10.285, Kenai River Overlay District, to correct references to the Kenai Peninsula Borough Code and to provide consistency in the regulations of activities along anadromous streams. Introduced by the city manager, public hearing on February 10th, 2021. Ordinance 2021-002, increasing estimated revenues and appropriations by $10,000 in the utility fund and authorizing the city manager to execute a contract with Everline Building Inc. in the amount of $32,324 for the wastewater treatment plant cold storage conversion project. Introduced by the city manager, public hearing on February 10th, 2021. New business resolutions, resolution 2021-007, authorizing the purchase of calcium chloride dust control chemical for $21,080 from North Star Supply LLC, introduced by the city manager. And that is your consent agenda. Are there any public comments on any of the items just read by the clerk? Uh, for those participating through Zoom, Please raise your hand if you would like to comment. App users by pressing the raise your hand button and the phone participants by dialing star nine on your telephone. And I see no hands raised. Having no, having no one uh, wishing to speak uh, to the approval of the agenda and consent agenda is back before the uh, council. Are there any? Uh, any council objections to approving the agenda and consent agenda? Seeing none, um, the agenda and consent agenda are approved. Uh, moving on to the item number four on the agenda, public comments and presentations, items other than those appearing on the agenda, three minutes per speaker, 20 minutes aggregate. Are there any members of the, from the public who would like to speak on any item not appearing on the agenda? For those participating through Zoom, please raise your hand if you would like to or comment. App users by pressing the raise your hand button and phone participants by dialing star nine on your telephone. I see no hands raised, so we will close public comments and move on to item number five on the uh, agenda, assembly and legislative report. Are there any representatives from the borough or the state in attendance who would like to speak? Seeing none, uh, we'll close this part of the agenda and move on to number item number six, administrative reports. Uh, auditor presentation by Joy Mariner of BDO, 
USA, limited liability. And, um, oh, there I see her. You're on. Hello, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Uh, lovely to see you. Normally, I actually get to see you. And uh, my name's Joy, for those of you whom I've not had the chance to meet. Um, I uh, am Joy Mariner. I'm a partner at BDO. I've been with our Anchorage office for um, over 18 years, I guess, working with municipal governments across the state of Alaska on financial reporting. And I worked with the city of Soldotna this year on the financial statement audit uh, with Melanie and Stephanie and your crew there. Um, I also have with me Travis Werba. He's one of our managers who was also on site with me for your audit this year. Travis actually grew up uh, in your neck of the woods and uh, his family still lives there. So he was always very, he's always been very glad to have a chance to work um, back home for a couple of weeks on, on your audit. So um, what I'd like to do for our presentation First off, if you have questions or comments, please go ahead and, and we're pretty familiar with using uh, Zoom. So feel free to either um, you know, physically raise your hand or interrupt us along the way so we can answer your questions. Um, and then you know, also what I'd like to do from just an audit presentation standpoint in the limited time we do have uh, is go through some of the audit required communications. Travis is gonna cover that audit wrap up document with you. And then I'm gonna cover some financial highlights from the CAFR. And hopefully you do have both of those documents. Those are the two documents we will reference. I promise this, I know that this is always the highlight of your year to hear the auditor's report and go through your, I mean, I don't know how many pages the audit report statements are. Let's see, 132 pages of the PDF, which I will be covering in exact detail. All 100, no, I'm kidding, I won't do that. I'm gonna go through some key financial highlights for you and make sure you understand what's included in the packet so you can be informed and then take the time um, later to go through any areas that you you know, wanna dive into on your own. Um, just know that we're your auditors, we work for you as the council. Um, obviously we work pretty closely with Stephanie and Melanie throughout the year. Um, but you know, our job is to protect the citizens of your city and make sure that the financial statements of your city are accurately reported, that the information is fairly presented. And you know, we're, we wanna make sure that you have the tools that you need to serve uh, the people of Soldotna well. So with that, let me turn it over to Travis to go through the audit wrap up document. And Travis, I believe you can share your screen or I'm happy to do that if that's easier. Yeah, I can try do that. I think, does everyone uh, share? Can everyone see the audit wrap up document? Yeah, hopefully. Okay, so um, we completed the audit. So as part of our part of our communication, we want to present to the board um, our findings and kind of the results of the audit. So that's what this document is doing here. Um, on June 10th, uh, we presented kind of our audit plan to Melanie and her team of what our audit procedures and what our audit plan was that year. So um, the good news is nothing really changed from that. We've kind of put our plan together and what that plan was, uh, we were able to see that through and there was no issues that we came across, which is always good. Um, and as far as um, our, the status of the audit, we're issuing an unmodified opinion over the financial statements, which is the highest level of assurance um, we can give over the financial statements. Um, there also manage, management's cooperation, um, a few, just a few things or bullet points in here. Um, management's cooperation was great. Melanie and her team are always great in um, that providing us the information that's required and needed. Um, to complete our audit and um, they've always been, I've worked with Melanie now, I think two years um, and she's always been great to work with as well as her team. So we always appreciate that. It makes our job much easier um, and makes things go much smoother. Um, the goal of the audit is not to gain absolute assurance. It's to gain a reasonable assurance over the financial statements. So um, just just be aware of that. Um, we, If we were to gain absolute assurance, um, we would be on site all year and I don't think uh, Melanie wants that, and I don't think we want that either. So, um, the next page, if we're to continue with the results of the audit, this page kind of goes through the um, just kind of 
estimates or significant estimates as we call them. And these are um, areas where management can uh, potentially, um, they're just a higher risk. There's some judgment involved and whatnot. Um, the, the one thing with the city or most cities is that they don't really have what we call significant estimates. They do have some estimates in their financial statements, as you can see below. Um, the allowance for uncollectible accounts, you don't really know how much uh, always, if people are going to pay, that's kind of a projection or um, a number that management doesn't know exact. So it is a judgment, but um, typically and historically, the city's had no issues with um, these, these things. So we don't consider them um, significant estimates. Um, they, you typically collect all your AR balances and whatnot. Um, the next tab continuing with, or next page, I should say, sorry. Um, it just the more results of the, the audit. And this is about corrected and uncorrected misstatements. So I'm happy to report that there was no corrected and no, corre uncor no uncorrected misstatements this year. So Melanie and her team did a great job. Um, no, I mean, she's great at reaching out for questions. I know she's on the phone, phone with Joy a lot throughout the year, um, asking, hey, how should we book this and whatnot. So um, that's, uh, we have no no recommendations there or any areas of concern. Travis, could I interrupt um, for just a second? Uh, if you could maybe uh, increase the size of this, uh, it's a little small on our version, if you can get it up to like 100% okay. or something. Um, is that better? Maybe a little bit more. That's great. Okay. Okay, so this is the uncorrected misstatements. Um, then we can go down to the... Uh, Next page here. So um, this one area I do want to draw attention to um, in this, some of it just covers like estimates once again, but uh, significant or unusual transactions. One area that was unusual this year was the CARES funding. So um, that was actually a major program this year. And um, since it's such a large amount of federal funding, so we, we um, performed additional audit procedures over that um, to make sure it was in uh, in accordance with the federal uh, the federal requirements. So I'm happy to report that there's n we didn't identify any issues with that program or anything like that, but that is um, going to be further discussed in the financials in note 13. So when Joy is going through that, we'll be, um, you can see in more detail. Um, on the next page, there. This is the. Uh, we do look at the in, the city's internal controls and um, make sure that they're they're operating effectively and then that they're in place. Uh, this is a key part in how we design uh, our audit procedures and whatnot. And it's um, it's always good to have the checks and balances in a company. So we want to make sure that. Um, those are in place and that they're operating effectively. Um, we did not identify any um, material weaknesses, significant deficiencies, or any other um, issues with the internal controls. So Melanie and her team do a great job of making sure those checks, checks and balances are operating effectively and um, are in place. Um, and then we have other communications. Um, there's, this is kind of um, no, no significant uh, changes from our original plan, um, what was previously discussed. We, um, no disagreements with management or anything like that. So um, there's just some, some high level summary stuff there. Um, and then on the next page here, we there's some new GASB standards that are coming into effect in 2021, which, um, you as a board should be aware of. And um, this is something that we communicate with Melanie and, uh, and and as far as implementing them going forward and what, what the requirements will be. So um, any questions on the wrap up doc here? And one thing I'll add on the future pronouncements and the things that are coming up, there are changes to leases. I think I mentioned it to you before um, I know some cities are actually taking a little bit of time to really dive in. I, I think this might have gotten extended by a year, so you might even have until 2022. Um, I have to look at those dates. They keep changing the dates on when that implements. Um, 
But I will say that the leases shouldn't be that big of a deal, except, you know, having a really comprehensive list of all your leases and how they needed to be treated is important. And it's not, you know, I, I would say if COVID-19 hadn't hit, then the finance directors might have had time to do projects related leases and getting that information all pulled together. Uh, right now, everybody's running a little uh, thin in terms of amount of time they have to deal with stuff. So when you, when you add an essentially an entire new world on top of what was already in place with remote work and cares and um, COVID response and all of that stuff, um, there is some concern, I would say, from my side that the state of Alaska, just generally governments have enough resources to implement the standard well. So it's something that I'll talk with Stephanie and Melanie about. I know they're already looking at it. Um, it's something just for you to be aware of. Basically, your leases just go on the balance sheet. You have to have a full comprehensive list of all of them, and they each need to be looked at to make sure they're being accounted for correctly. Uh, the other one that is um, in place or coming into play is, I, I believe it's GASB 90. Um, it might be even on the next page. Um, and that relates to kind of fiduciary type of assets and liabilities. And you do have the um, fiduciary funds here at Soldana related to... Let me just pull that up really Thanks, fast. The, the, yeah, the private purpose trust. And so there are some changes coming down with how those will get reported and the disclosures related to those trust um, assets. This year, you'll notice the statements break out a little bit more information about your investments and how the trust investments are actually held and what they're held in. Um, but, you know, just know that there's some changes to that. The more of those kinds of things you do, the more work that it takes finance to make sure that they're being tracked properly and reported properly. Um, so those are the two kind of areas that are coming up that I just want to kind of bring to your attention. Um, I think your team's on top of it, but uh, worth mentioning. Uh, any questions for me or Travis on the wrap up before we look at a few high level financial statement items? Okay, this is the exciting part. That was super exciting, Travis. No, um, not, not to say that it wasn't exciting. But you don't want the audit wrap up to be exciting because that's where all of the findings would be, right? So we want a boring audit wrap up um, as it relates to the the results anyway. You don't want to have any sort of audit results that are very exciting. So when you look at your CAFR, a couple quick things. Your CAFR is 132 pages on the PDF. I do not expect you to be able to understand or even um, read or want. I'm sure you can read it, but I'm not sure you want to read the whole thing. But let's step back for a second and tell you what the CAFR is for. So the CAFR is a financial statement, but it covers a whole lot more than that. It has a lot of information about the financial health of your city, who you are, what were the results for the year. It's one of the documents you'll keep uh, for long term. Most CAFRs are kept for probably 30 years, the life of your bonds anyway, many even longer than that. Somebody 10, 15, 20 years from now might want to know how you spent your CARES Act money and they'll look back. Hey, what happened during that pandemic? How how did they handle the money? How was it spent? You know, so this is a historic record um, and it doesn't get destroyed after some period of time. Could we the other thing I'll note. Can I, can I interrupt you there for just a second? Uh, Please. Two things. Bring it up to maybe 125%, so it's a little bit easier for everyone to see. And then uh, I believe uh, Vice Mayor Parker had a hand up for a question. Oh, okay. Please go ahead, Vice Mayor. And, I, and as soon as I start sharing my screen, I no longer see the whole group all at once. So I'll do try to fix that so I can see you all. Go ahead. I, w I was just going to ask the same thing that the mayor asked, and I will have a question here as we get going through this. Absolutely. Um. So this is, I'll make it, I'll zoom in where it makes sense to zoom in, I promise, so you can see the numbers that I'm talking about. When I look at your CAFR, one, a couple things to keep in mind. This CAFR is drafted by Melanie. It's reviewed by Stephanie. Um, you're, there's only a handful of finance directors who can draft a CAFR every year. There's a couple of advantages to this. One is it saves you a, a, just a ton of money. Um, that your staff can draft their CAFR on their own. We draft a lot of financial statements for clients. It can take a lot of time to put it together. But the other advantage is that a lot of errors or even just nuances, trends are found when you draft the CAFR. So when Melanie is going through the exercise of, okay, putting in all your investments, this is when she, she asks questions about them. And oftentimes to me or to Stephanie, hey, did you know this looks like this? This looks strange to me. Why is it being presented this year? Is this correct? And so there's, you know, really a, 
um, a benefit to making sure that your finance director is qualified and to do that. And you have a really highly qualified team there, which is excellent. Um, the other thing I'll note is this is the effort, I would say, of, a, of a, a much bigger effort for FY 2020 because of COVID. I hate to blame everything in the world on COVID right now, but um, I, I have to tell you that the sheer amount of information that I, I'm sure many of you had to learn in a short period of time was uh, quite phenomenal to me. And uh, the CARES Act came out, Travis mentioned we didn't have any findings on your CARES Act. We only audited expenditures so far through June 30th of 2020. So you do have a lot of your money was spent, you know, between June 30 and 1231 and even going on into fiscal, you know, into calendar year 2021, fiscal year 2021. What year is it? I get them all mixed up. But I have to tell you between all of the different acts and the requirements and the FAQs, they were coming out weekly, sometimes daily with new guidance. And I have to say that Stephanie and Melanie were calling me and I am so appreciative that they did because they were calling me and asking me things like, what do I need to document? How do I document it this way? You know, we're not sitting in the office all together. Are you going to be okay with me signing this this way or me approving it this way? Or, you know, what controls do we need to make um, put in place? They were asking me eligibility questions before they ever spent the money some of which I could not answer because they didn't have the guidance. You know, I, I kept going back. I think we, I remember Stephanie, we were talking one afternoon and my kids were jumping on the trampoline. That's when in the back of my mind, that's what was going on. And I was just feeling like, that's how I feel like we're all just kind of jumping on this trampoline of, you know, do we have any information? No, we don't. We were just going up and down and going back to the actual legislation um, because that was as much as we had. And, and, you know, I think people were asking decisions to be made a municipal government. And I'm sure you felt that way as a council, but your team was very conservative in their approach, very careful and well thought out. And that's what keeps you out of trouble. I'm not reporting a finding for CARES because your team has been very, and I'm sure with your leadership, very careful to follow the rules as you know them. And frankly, a lot of it for me is documentation. Did you document things as best as you could at the time it happened? You're not, you know, forging stuff six months later to try to be in line with things. It was documented in the first place. And that keeps you um, really well out of trouble. So not having a finding on CARES is kind of amazing, given that the audit rules for CARES came out on December 23rd of 2020. That's when the guidance was actually issued. And actually, it was just last week that they came out with the formal a CFR on it. And Stephanie, I'll send you that link. So you have the actual formal document that we wished we had when this all happened in June. So uh, it, it's kind of psycho in the way that it's worked out. But this CAFR is um, really a Herculean effort this year. Um, Melanie still had it done on time. She was done with the CAFR draft, you know, in October, early November, which is just amazing given the pressure that her team has been under. So I just want to, I'll throw that out there. I'm not having the same conversation with everybody. It's just not been the same for everybody. Um, and let's talk about a few highlights. The CAFR is a comprehensive report. It's meant to give you a lot of information. I will be only covering a few select pages. But if you look at the table of contents, you can see that it includes a letter of transmittal. This is a, a just an overview of your city and what you face this year. There's also your certificate of achievement for excellence that was received on last year's statements. So you did receive that and you did apply for it again in this year's statements. Um, this is issued by the Government Finance Officers Association and your team has done a great job in um, receiving that award annually. There's also principal officials and org chart on there. You're on there. So congratulations for being part of the CAFR. Um, and then there's also some and other sections. So the financial section I'll touch on includes your auditor's report and a management discussion and analysis. That's like an annual report for a company, but this is obviously your city, but it gives you a detail kind of for several years of what were some of the trends? What were the increases? Why? If the only thing you read um, as you're going to bed tonight is page three to page 12, those are the pages that will be the most helpful. And there's actually, in my opinion, there's probably only three of those pages that are even the most helpful. Those will give you the talking points to talk to the folks of the city about what really is going on. Um, because those pages are gonna be the most important with the trends and the changes. 
And then we have our basic financial statements that are required to be presented. I'm going to cover about five of those pages. There's required supplementary information, which includes budget information and lots of information about your pension and OPEB plans through PERS. And then you have roll-up schedules on your non-major funds, your internal service funds, and uh, your federal schedule with all your federal awards on it. And then lastly, included in the packet is uh, two other sections, your statistical section, which has 10-year historical data. So you want to see how the general fund expenses changed? Look at uh, these data sets, because this is going to be the most helpful to look at um, historical data. And then the single audit section, which gives you the results of the audit we were, the work we did on compliance for your airport improvement program this year and CARES. Again, Travis already mentioned, no findings. Everything went great, um, but those are the results that are presented in the single audit section. So that's what's contained in the CAFR. And before I move on to the few pages of the financial section I want to cover with you, are there any questions about what's contained in the CAFR or what we've talked about so far? Go ahead. Um, uh, thank you. And thank you for the, once again doing the, doing the audit. Um, the question that I had, and I believe that you answered it, is com with the CARES Act compared to other communities, particularly internal controls that we put in place, um, based on your comments, it sounds like we have taken a very good approach. As you said, we, uh, Stephanie and Melanie were conservative and, and well thought out in terms of, of the, how we were going to expand and document the CARES Act. So um, I didn't know if you had anything additional to add in terms of how we have implemented expenditures under the CARES Act as compared to what you've seen with other communities around the state. Yeah, that's an excellent question. You know, back in April before CARES was passed, we were having conversations about FEMA, actually. You know, I, and, and Stephanie was saying, hey, well, we want to be eligible for FEMA. How do I make sure I'm eligible for FEMA? So we were talking about, you know, the, the concept of just document, 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 because FEMA is one of those, um, you know, magnifying glass check mark box agencies. And, um, you know, so I think that was the approach that was taken from the very beginning, which allowed you the ability once CARES came out, out that, that to really just have that already in place. One of the questions that was early on a question was, you know, can you really just charge public safety across the board to CARES? It, you know, is that really in line with the legislation? Is that going to be accepted by the community? Is the Treasury really saying that? I mean, I think there was some confusion with the way the Treasury guidance was issued that a lot of people weren't sure. And, um, you know, really that wasn't even clarified until December 23rd, if I'm honest with you. I think everybody, I actually thought if they go back on this and they don't allow that, they're going to have a, you know, a huge problem and a huge lawsuit on their hands. But I think I even talked to Stephanie, you know, call, call Murkowski, call Sullivan if they try to do that, because they're just, they're, they're giving you bad guidance then. And the original compliance supplement that came out in October, we saw a draft. I wasn't supposed to get my hands on a draft, but I might know somebody who knows somebody who got me my draft of this um, supplement. It didn't address that. It, it actually implied it wouldn't be allowed. And so, you know, even back to six months after the act was passed, there were questions about the allowability. And I would say, though, that um, your team really took, you know, a, a hard look on what would work. And then percentage wise, you, you put a lot of investment in your community. And, you know, that to me is a fairly conservative use of the money that, and the funds are allowable for that. It's pretty clear. So, um, you know, the way that you handled the process, I think was really above board and very transparent. And that to me is, you know, goes a long way and keeps you out of a lot of trouble. Um, if you can comply with FEMA, you can comply with with CARES. <laughs> and so, you, you know, taking that really hard line approach on documentation was really, I think, um, what gets you there. The controls were not normal controls. I'll be honest with you. That's always scary to me because you have these set ways that things are processed, right? This is how we handle, um, you know, payroll on federal grants. This is how we handle procurement. This is how we handle, you know, all of these different things. 
the pandemic hits, people are working remotely, the documentation changes. There's a lot of things that changed here. The change management process was pretty crazy. But when it comes right down to it, the federal rules are clear. It has to be approved, it has to be tracked, and it has to be what they use the word contemporaneously documented. So it has to be at the time. And I think as long as you know your team knew, knew, knew that, they were talking to me about that, and they took the steps to make sure they did the documentation along the way. Um, that's what that I think makes the difference. Uh, the other communities, I won't speak to too much detail. A lot of communities didn't manage to spend much before June 30th. Um, they were fighting amongst each other, or they just weren't organized, or they were scared. For whatever reason, they didn't spend the money until after year end. Um, so I'm working with those folks now on making sure things are right. But uh, a lot of them, I haven't audited those expenses. Uh, Municipality of Anchorage, I audit. Uh, that audit just kicked off. So it'll be interesting to see how some of those kinds of things were handled. And then, of course, they changed the, the deadline for the use of the funds seven days before it expired. Great timing. Um, and so I think we're all kind of dealing with um, very unusual circumstances that so far your team has come out um, doing very well on. I'll show you where the CARES actually hits in the statements. And, and that's one of the areas that, you know, I, I think is important for you to see in the statements themselves. So if you have the PDF, you can follow along. I will promise to make it bigger. I just can't see my page numbers until I get there. So let's start. I'm going to spend just a couple minutes on page 13, which is page 30 of the PDF if you're looking at your own copy. Um, this is your statement of net position, which shows you at a high level all the things you own, assets, and things that you owe to others, liabilities. Now, this is government-wide. It includes all of the things. <laughs> so you can see here your largest category of assets. Maybe I'll make that go away is uh, related to property and equipment and service. Those are things you're gonna turn around and liquidate, right? These are you know, actual assets, water, sewer, airport, those kinds of assets, your building that um, some of you are in. Um, those are all assets of the city. You do have a lot in cash and investments. And then your largest category of liabilities are your bond and loan payable numbers, which really for a city your size, 3.5 million, uh, you're very conservative in terms of your debt load, um, which I always like to see. I think that's healthy. Um, and then the net pension liability is about 7 million. Uh, keep in mind the net pension liability is just your PERS liability and your PERS OPEB. Um, PERS OPEB is about 240. You can't pay that off. You're paying that down as you pay your pension contribution every payroll. So uh, that number just fluctuates depending on the market, how long people live, um, and some other assumptions that the actuaries come up with. But that number isn't a number you can pay off. So I don't kind of view it as a long-term debt liability, but more it's a, a long-term payable uh, that you're going to be paying down um, over the next 30 years or so, barring some other legislative action. Um, the governmental funds balance sheet is on page 15, and this shows you by fund what your assets and liabilities are, as well as your fund balance. Now, a couple quick things here. Uh, you can see you've got um, four major funds. The general fund, the public utility special revenue fund. This is where all your public utility activities run. Then you have a new fund, CARES Act, uh, for 2020. You'll have it in 2021 as well. And then the Airport Improvement Capital Project Fund, which is holding all the FAA improvement money and uh, that's where that money is being spent. You also some have some non-major funds, um, which we can look at if you want, but these are the big, big activities of the city. And this is at June 30th, how much money was still held in the, those funds. The general fund had about 18.5 million of fund balance. Some of that was committed, some of that was assigned for certain specific things, and about $10 million of that was unassigned. I'm gonna get into that story in just a moment. So I know you have questions about that. But look here and a couple other things. The Unearned Revenue for CARES Act, this is the money that you'd been advanced by the state of Alaska that you had not spent as of June 30th. Keep in mind that some of the money came after June 30th. So this was just the amount that you had in cash that had not yet been spent as of June 30th. And then um, you also have the Airport and Capital Improvement Funds where you did have quite a lot of receivables from your grants still in the Capital Improvement Fund. Monies you'd spent, but they hadn't paid you for. But you also still owed 
uh, some of your vendors' liabilities, right? You were waiting on um, paying your vendors. Um, that's just the timing of when you get the invoices from the vendors. They don't always invoice you on June 30th for everything they've done through June 30th. Usually there's a couple uh, weeks lag there. So let's look at the story a little bit because I think that's really what people want to hear. That's on page 17. And this gives you the ins and outs for the year for these funds. General fund total revenues of 10.27. You have public utility fund of 2.33, which is fairly consistent. The CARES Act money, you spend about a million of that, and you earn that money as you spend it. Um, and then your airport improvement capital project fund had about 2.7 million of grant money that was spent in 2020. On the expense side, the story gets more interesting because you can see here the general fund total expenditures uh, were 8.6 million, which is lower than normal. That doesn't mean you didn't spend that money, it, but a lot of that money was allocated to CARES. I wish I could highlight this, but I don't know if you can see the hand there. There's that public safety line in CARES and some amount of general government. Certain expenses that would normally have been covered by the general fund, including public safety wages, were covered by the CARES fund. So you, for this one year, the general fund is not holding all of those expenses. They were moved over into the CARES fund. And I'm gonna jump really quickly so you can see what that looks like because in the general fund budget in the back, I don't need you to jump with me unless you wanna follow along in this, uh, in this manner, but this is page 62. You can see here, this is total expenditures. There's the final budget, the actual budget and the variance. In the city manager category, a lot of Stephanie's time um, was, and her team's time was spent on COVID pandemic response. And so what was budget of 316, 202,000 was actual in the general fund because a significant portion of that was moved to CARES. And the same story is happening down in police where you have a budget of 2.27, actual 1.5, 792 as a budget favorable, unspent. But when you actually go and look at the CARES fund, a significant portion of that money was expensed over in the CARES fund. Stephanie, go ahead. Thank you, Joy. And I want to restate this as a non-finance person. It was not intuitive to me how these use of these funds would show up in our in our um, financial statements. And they don't actually show up as additional revenue like I thought they would. They really show up uh, any funds we spent on personnel. So any of our personnel expenses, which uh, for the period of time that we're covering here, ending in June 30th of 2020, of all of our use of the CARES Act funds, that was a portion of the time where we build more to personnel. So that was mainly a public safety payroll. And it was also our um, emergency operations team, which must, was myself and several of our other department heads. Early on, we're spending a lot of time in meetings, you know, every day of the week, uh, standing up new policies and things. So really for the fiscal year that we're looking at, this of all the CARES Act funds is gonna be the most dramatically shifted towards personnel. Uh, this period through June 30th shows up as, as a lot of personal expenses, mostly uh, police department, but also some other city employees. And it shows up in our financial statements as a reduction of expenditures in the general fund uh, because those expenditures were incurred, but they now hit this other CARES Act fund. Um, moving forward into our next year's audit, uh, July 1st and forward, there will be much less of that because most of our CARES Act spending that occurred in this current fiscal year we're in was in grants, was in programs, you know, economic development and nonprofits, much less of it hit payroll, but really the bulk of the payroll we have reported as being grant eligible occurred in this period we're talking about March through June 30th. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. And, and so the grant programs that you've done and, and the assistance that you've provided to the community next year will be in this CARES Act special revenue fund as an expense, but that's an additional expense. Um, and I know that a lot of communities use public safety because really that's the primary role of public safety in that period of time uh, really was a lot of pandemic response. They had a lot of additional work that they were doing and it was allowed under the CARES Act to do that. Um, we do not know what the impacts will be in FY21 or FY22 to the city's financials as a result of the pandemic. We don't know from a sales tax perspective or even federal or state grants or you know additional costs. There, there, we don't know what the impact will be. So the bottom line impact, the general fund did have a positive change in fund balance this year of about $588,000. 
that's not normal for your general fund. But I'll tell you that I am, I really, I'll emphasize that that doesn't mean that that money is not going to be used to address this pandemic in 2021 and 2022. Um, and having the ability to, to have some flexibility when your revenue impact is known, what's the impact going to be to taxes? What's impact going to be to some of those things is going to be pretty important for you as a city. Um, there are some cities in the lower 48 um, that are, you know, at the brink. They didn't have the reserves. They didn't plan for the future. I think Alaskans are pretty resilient and we know that we get hit. Whatever it hits and hitting us, that, you know, these typhoons, they don't call typhoons. They, you know, the, the winds, they call them windstorms up here, which I think is just so silly. It's like a hurricane, call it a hurricane, you know, or the, the earthquakes or the, the natural disasters. I think Alaskans are tough and they know we can't just you know, survive on a lean, a lean margin. We've got to have enough buffer to, to, to weather these things quite literally. And so I think we're doing better than a lot of other places and other um, communities are because of those kinds of attitudes. Um, and this is a good way that sets you up for what is inevitably going to be some fluctuation and uncertainty in your tax base going into the following year. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Hopefully I'll be fishing on the Kenai and this, this summer with all of my friends and, you know, spending lots of money on sales tax eligible purposes, purposes in Soldatna. But I do think that we just don't know how that will look and how it will end up. Um, okay, so those two statements I think are pretty important for you to understand. I just have a couple other ones I wanted to touch on. Uh, the notes to the financial statements start here on page 25. The notes provide a lot of additional information. So if you ever wanted to find out, for example, what your investment policy is, that's included in the notes. There's a lot more detail about your, you know, how your deposits are actually invested. What's the weights? What's the risk? What's the, you know, the credit risk and the interest rate risk and the credit custodial credit risk and all of the things associated with investments. So if that's an area you're interested in, or if you're, you know, developing a new policy, this has the good historic information. Uh, there's also information about your capital assets, what they're invested in, uh, your receivables. Uh, so, for example, the public utility fund has customer receivables of $223,000. Um, and then your um, interfund activity, your long-term debt, and your bonds. You do have your library expansion bonds that are being paid off through 20, 2031. Um, and you do have DEC loans best deal in town. That was an excellent decision you all made uh, a few years ago to get the DEC loans at one and a half percent interest. By the way, um, the state is forgiving some of these loans just randomly. We've, we've gotten word of that. So if you have a chance to talk to a state legislature about, legislator about that, feel free to just drop a hint that wouldn't it be great if they just forgave our, our water loan? <laughs> uh, we are, we're seeing some loan forgiveness coming from the federal and state government. Um, from DEC. So not only is it low interest, but there's a chance that they'll just forgive it. Um, it's one of the ways they can do a capital investment without having a capital budget. So the state's kind of using that. Um, then there's um, also more information about your fund balance. You do have uh, money set aside for unexpected events. You kind of have that $5 million uh, general fund reserve that was established uh, by the council. And that is there as well as $10 million in unassigned in the general fund. And um, the other funds do hold monies for certain things um, like your non-recurring revenue or your um, utility operations being set aside in the utility fund. And then there are, oh gosh, I'll make it small because I don't really think you want to read it. Probably 15 pages of pension notes. So somebody's made a wrong decision and now everybody has to deal with 15 pages of pension notes. So I'm not going to look at those. And subsequent to year end, you did issue in July uh, general obligation bonds for the library, um, and you refinance those library bonds. So I misspoke earlier when I said they, um, a portion of those. So you did use those um, to pay off the remaining principal um, and a present value savings in that refunding transaction of 134000 And then you did allow some conduit debt to be issued for Hope Community Resources through the city. Um, there are some new standards coming with conduit debt as well. So the accounting treatment for that conduit debt is going to be more complicated for Melanie. There's a really, there really is a true cost to issuing conduit debt from an administrative perspective. So just keep that in mind. I'm not saying you don't do it. Hope Community Resources is one of my favorite agencies in the state. They do amazing things. 
but there is a, a cost administratively to your team when you do issue conduit debt. And then the last page I'll mention is page 57. With COVID-19, you do have this beautiful, huge one and a half page note about COVID-19, how it's uncertain. This is a, the, the highlights, what happened, um, that you didn't have any impact at this point to sales tax and property taxes. You did reduce your uh, sewer and water utility charges and a rate decrease for certain months, as well as suspending penalty and interest payments. Um, you did have some impact to your Soldotna Regional Sports Complex revenue because that's, you know, uh, shut down. You're not having user fees when you can't open it. <clears throat> and just unknowns related to investments and the market volatility. <coughs> We're not certain what will happen in the future, but you do have an excellent financial position. And I think you're in a strong position to weather that. So I concur with this. There's also a little more information about the CARES Act funding. You were awarded just under 10 million. As of June 30th, 1 million of that had been spent. These are how they were spent uh, as of June 30th. And then another 8.9 million uh, was spent after year end or is to be spent still. Uh, this is pretty um, current. Melanie tells me that 2.96 million is what is planned to be spent into FY21. So these top uh, six categories in the note are what has really been incurred through the end of December. Um, and I really applaud you for those business grants and the nonprofit grants. I sit on the Anchorage Chamber and uh, I would love to have seen this level of investment in you know, an Anchorage business percentage wise to what you've been able to commit to your businesses locally. I'm very impressed by that. You know, makes me want to open a business in Soldotna, maybe someday. Um, but, you know, great, great relief for the community. Um, you, it's a lot of work to issue these grants because you, they have to certify a need. They, you can't just throw money out, right? They have to actually certify needs. So administratively, your team had work to do to get there. Um, but, you know, this is a pretty impressive footnote and I think is one that's worth you reading in detail. Those are the main uh, pages I wanted to cover in the notes. There's lots of other information. The general fund budget to actual starts here on page 61, and that's good. Just if you want to see where funding went, how you did with budget and staying on budget, uh, feel free to look through those. And um, as Travis mentioned, uh, the last page of this PDF covers our schedule of findings and question costs. He mentioned no findings. I'm not sure you realize necessarily how many things that means no findings on. We had not only did we have an unmodified opinion on the statements, we had no internal control findings. These are all of the things we have to report to you if we had a finding on. These are, this is our checklist that we test against. Um, and no, 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 no findings on internal control or financial reporting or your federal program compliance or other non-compliance that we might have found. Um, we look at your payroll taxes. We look at your pension contributions. We look at a lot. Um, and we did, as I mentioned before, um, audit your coronavirus relief fund and your airport improvement program with no reported findings. So uh, with that, I'll open up to questions and, uh, you know, just again, really thank your team, you know, really robust group of people who, who care a lot about your city and do the right thing. Uh, Travis probably hit him with more requests. We, we actually had to apologize when we found out we had to audit CARES and we got the samples together. I remember Travis and I just sitting there just thinking, oh no, poor Melanie. You know, and I think we came back to audit the borough and came back and audited some of those expenses, gave them a little extra time to pull them. Because the federal sample sizes are, I think we had to pick up, Travis, correct me if I'm wrong, like 60 or 120, maybe it was 120 samples because of the federal compliance requirements. And, uh, you know, that's just a huge lift. And this was in October when they were dealing with business grants and all sorts of other things. So. Um, I'll stop talking, open up to questions, and just thank, thank the city for, for doing a great job. Thank your team, and, and it's always a pleasure to work, uh, work with you, um, and especially in this year, having clients who are ethical and trying to do the right thing and uh, communicating throughout the process has made uh, my job you know, really pleasant in such a really difficult time. So uh, with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and pause for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from the council? Any questions from the staff? Oh, uh, Vice Mayor Parker. I, I just want to thank uh, 
the city manager and our finance director and BDO for all of the work that they have, have done. In the years that I have been on council, I don't think there has ever been a, a finding in, in the audits that have been done of the city of Zobotna. So um, we are fortunate to have the quality of, of folks that we do and to to Joy and the Anchorage Chamber, the city of Sulbatna started a program in December that we borrowed from the city of Haines that the city of Kenai is also doing where um, if individuals spend money at businesses that have uh, stepped in and say they wanna participate, um, you can come back in and get vouchers. It's uh, a great way. We put up almost 300,000, Stephanie, of CARES Act funding that um, generated $600,000 in sales to our local businesses. So overall, it generated almost a million dollars of, of revenue within the community. So it's something that, um, tell Mr. Bustamante, he needs to take a look at. I will talk to Bruce, he's on, so the chamber has very little say in how the city decides to spend their money. Um, but we do have a task force and Bruce is leading the task force right now of economic recovery. And um, we have our municipal action committee does um, meet with the mayor and at least give our suggestions for those kinds of things rather regularly. So I'll, I, I'll have uh, I'll have Bruce hit you up for more information on that because he would love to hear about it, I'm sure. Any other questions from the council? Uh, seeing none, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Um, I'd like to really thank our staff for all the hard work they do. Um, I mean, uh, like Vice Mayor Parker said, I've been on the council for a number of years and we've always had a good report and it sounds like uh, we're in good financial shape now and uh, look for a brighter future. And thank you. Thank you, everyone. We'll move on to... Um, Item seven on the agenda, public hearings, and we have none this evening. Uh, next item on the agenda is eight, new business, and that would be resolution 2021-006, amending the authorized staffing table in the fiscal year 21 operating budget to add a full-time maintenance technician position in the streets and maintenance department introduced by the city manager. May I have a motion to adopt? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Ms. Hutchings. And um, a report from the administration. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so this resolution would authorize the city to move forward with the creation of a new position. And it's actually a new position that we would like to transition one of our existing long-term employees into uh, within the maintenance department. And many people in the community are familiar that our streets and maintenance department is responsible for snow removal in the winter, uh, repairing asphalt and putting up Christmas decorations and those kind of things. But we also have a shop uh, at, at down Sunny River Road just past the airport. And also within the scope of duties of our maintenance department is keeping our fleet running, keeping our equipment running. We've got two mechanics. We do a lot of uh, maintenance, deferred maintenance, preventative, as well as repairs out of that shop. And this position, I think, would um, be a great addition to the operations of that department because it would do some both administrative functions, helping with expediting parts, helping with uh, scheduling maintenance, as well as hands-on repairs, uh, assisting our two employees that are out there at the Fine River Shop. So we have developed uh, kind of the framework of this new position, and I did that in consultation with Scott Sundberg, our maintenance department manager, uh, and Jessica O'Regan, our HR manager, and we respectfully request the council to consider adding this position. Um, I did note that it's an additional full-time position, but in the most recent budget we adopted, we actually reduced the staffing within the maintenance department by about a half of a full-time position. And we did that by reorganizing our existing staff in a way that uh, in our experience so far has worked out very, very well. So it is an additional position with the additional um, funding that would be required for a full-time position. But looking kind of at the bigger picture, it represents essentially an additional half person compared to where we've been historically within that department. And as I mentioned, I think it'll serve our operation needs very well, help more efficiently serving um, 
both the community, but also the different departments that that department serves. If you can imagine, whenever a police cruiser, we had an incident with someone who was being transported just recently, pretty significant damage. Uh, they take it to the shop. Many times we're able in-house to deal with repairs, not only to parks and rec equipment, police equipment, et cetera. So thank you. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And uh, that concludes my report, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your report. Are uh, there any members of the public who wish to speak on this item? For those participating through Zoom, please raise your hand if you would like to comment. App users by pressing the raise your hand button and phone participants by dialing star 9 on your telephone. And I do not see anyone with raised hands. We'll bring it back to the council. Um, any comments from council? Seeing none, uh, are there any, uh, any uh, we'll call for the vote. Roll call, please. Council Member Hutchings? Yes. Ruffridge? Yes. Pamela Parker? Yes. Carey? Yes. Chilson? Yes. Lisa Parker? Yes. Student Representative Cox? Yes. You have six yes votes. Um, resolution 2020-006 passed on a 6-0 vote. Thank you. And we'll move on to item number nine on the agenda, uh, Mayor Council reports. Uh, my report is uh, be fairly brief. Um, I noticed in some of the city roads, and, and we've had some strange weather, warm, cold, rain, snow, um, but some of them are getting a little um, washboardy and pretty rough on the ice. I don't know if there's anything more we can do but I know driving on Colebuck and Maryland, on Marydale, I've been seeing people starting to drive in the center of the road uh, because it's smoother. Uh, so that might be, if, if we can do something, uh, at least improve it a little bit, it'd be helpful. Uh, meetings, uh, hopefully here very soon, we'll be able to have an in-person meeting again. Uh, I think we'll be looking at that here uh, very soon. And uh, I'd like to see all your smiling faces back here in this council chambers. And my last thing is uh, here again, just thank the staff for the fantastic job they have been doing. Um, the audit report is just another outstanding example of uh, what a great staff we have throughout the city. So that ends mine. Uh, council reports, the uh, library advisory board meeting, Mr. Carey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the library board met on January 18th. Uh, we met um, by Zoom. Um, the, one of the first items was re-election, excuse me, was election of officers. They re-elected their chair and their vice chair to excellent people. They continue, the staff as well as the volunteers, look for ways to provide service to the community. Uh, even while they were closed, they were very much working on still providing access by actually having people in their cars come up and they'd bring books out to them. Uh, it's just a wonderful they approved new policies on updated circulation and electronic equipment loan policy. And uh, again, uh, they're modernizing and they're just very up to date and it's very nice. There was also discussion about election day, about the idea of uh, the library being used and uh, um, the numbers were very strong, 700 plus in terms of on uh, one of the election days. And uh, uh, I commented to them what I saw, because when I first got there, we were still outside, it was early. They opened up the doors, allowed us to come in and we made a long line around the fireplace and down the back hall. There was a woman who was 102 years old and she came in, she had walked through and she was exhausted. And uh, she said, I just don't know if I can stay and stay and walk. And a number of people and I kind of helped. Uh, we got her a chair with uh, wheels on it. And it was just uh, so nice. That's an example of community as I understand it. The people all around, when they saw that she had a need, they wanted to instantly take care of it. She was pushed basically all the way through the line until it got up to uh, her being allowed to vote. Um, that's community and that's civic pride that we all uh, wanted to be sure that she got to vote and uh, the library just did an excellent job. Um, the meeting overall was uh, relatively short and to the point. And I really enjoy uh, getting to keep up with the library board as a past president of the Friends of the Library. So they did well and uh, we only meet every three months or so. And so I don't get to see them very often, but I appreciate it whenever I get to. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Carey. Solano Chamber of Commerce Board meeting, Mr. Chilson. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, we met on January 15th. Uh, it was a fairly brief meeting. We were able to confirm new board officers for 2021. Uh, spent some time reviewing the uh, voucher program we did to boost business uh, sales here across the Soldotan area. As you know, that had about $290,000 in vouchers uh, distributed, uh, generating almost a million dollars in revenue for 58 participating businesses. Um, moving forward, uh, they are easing back into chamber luncheons again, starting on February 3rd. They're going to be uh, co-hosting a luncheon at the uh, Kenai Visitor Center uh, for uh, Charlie Pierce, I believe is gonna be the keynote speaker there. Uh, also, they're beginning uh, preliminary planning for in-person events, uh, hoping that we will be able to do that again here, starting as soon as March 17th for St. Patrick's Day. Um, uh, still very much up in the air whether or not that's gonna happen, but if you follow uh, recent uh, positivity trends, it's looking very promising. Uh, and again, working with Levitt to continue planning for bringing back music in the park this summer, which I think the community definitely needs. Uh, and that's uh, all I have on our meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chilson. Uh, Kenai River Special Management Area by Mr. Carmichael. I don't see him on board right now, but he did pass out a written report to all of us by email, um, so we can accept that as uh, his, presented, his presentation. We move on to item number 10 on the agenda, City Manager's Report. Ms. Queen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, a couple items to report. And first I'll say um, it's always good to have BDO uh, present the audit information. Um, certainly if anything goes wrong, the council can hold me responsible. But in reality, when things go well, it's many, many other people. I play a much smaller role in those audits being done well. Uh, Melanie plays a large role, but even you know Kyle Cornelis, a lot of the FAA projects and the grant administration, and then the administrative teams that they both have uh, pulling together documents get all the get all the praise. So I'll echo the the thanks to the staff who are involved in, in getting such a clean, successful audit. Um, the CARES Act fine, just a few things to add to my written report that have happened in the week since I, I drafted that. Uh, we did meet internally and we presented a spending plan to the council on December 11th, I believe it was. This was before we knew that there would be a one year extension of those funds. What I had asked Melanie to do since uh, learning of that extension is to hold off on reporting some of the additional personnel costs. Uh, that would have been important if the city were gonna try and expend all those funds by the end of last year. But knowing that we now have an additional year, I asked her to hold off on reporting those. We can always do it after the fact, but I wanted to give the council the opportunity to decide whether that is still a priority. So with, with all the funding that uh, has been reported to the grant so far, we're looking at approximately two to 2.2 million that the city of Soldotna has to strategize and prioritize for this current year we're in. Uh, I had spoken to the mayor on Monday um, and we would plan to engage the two working groups, probably just one meeting each, one for the business focus group, one for the individual household and social services group uh, to both report out the successes and lessons learned from our previous grant funds spent, but also to solicit information on moving forward. Uh, so Mr. Zarneski is gonna work on uh, reaching out with invitations to those groups to have a meeting. And then we would plan to bring back to the council uh, a spending plan for you to uh, consider and ultimately decide what the priorities will be for the city's use of those funds moving forward. The second item I wanna note, um, we had a meeting with Dr. Hamilton from Alaska Christian College and some members of his team. Uh, they're working, you may be aware, they're working on a new athletic center project that has been several years in the works. And they recently approached the city to inquire whether it'd be feasible to extend the city's water line, the main line from where it terminates, um, kind of at the corner of the college, uh, KPC, where the sign is, to their project down Poppy Ridge Road. Um, we have had a couple meetings now and they've solicited a formal request and we let them know that what how that process would work is we're gonna take a look at the capacity of the utility to make that extension. I think it's feasible from a, from a utility standpoint, we can look at some code issues and design issues. And then ultimately that would need to be a development agreement between the city and the Christian college that would come before the council for your decision. So that process is the same. Uh, whenever main lines are extended at the request of a property owner, in this case, it happens to be a property just outside adjacent to the city limits but in terms of kind of doing our due diligence and 
um, vetting that project, uh, we would still intend to bring that uh, to the council at a later date when those details are better known. Uh, so the council can make a decision as to whether to move forward and authorize that extension of our, of our main to serve that project. The last thing I'll report is we have a meeting tomorrow uh, with KPB OEM staff, and we've had several conversations on how the city can support the mass vaccine disbursement events and how the city, what the city's role might be in helping get residents vaccinated. And it looks like the um, most critical need that we can assist with is actually staffing and personnel to staff as volunteers at some of these events. Um, so we're going to meet tomorrow with KPB OEM folks to understand what those roles might be. And then we will solicit volunteers from our own employees, um, paying them to essentially staff uh, some of these events, whether it's helping out with non-medical tasks, might be logistics, might be checking people in um, at events like the one that um, occurred at Salatna Prep on Saturday. It might also be uh, serving on a phone bank where when new appointments are available, you know, the librarians, for example, are really skilled at helping people get information and get signed up. It may be that we've got staff who are helping call our senior citizens and registering them over the phone. So assisting people in navigating that process. So I'll have a good understanding of what those roles might be. And I, I'm excited that we might be able to help out in that way. And I think a lot of our staff will be excited as well. And I think that concludes my report, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Ms. Pamela Parker. Thank you. I just had two questions, I think. Um, the library assisting folks with signing up for the vaccine, because I know that's a real challenge for some of our senior uh, members of the community. Is that something that we're advertising that folks can come in and get assistance with that? Because I know there's been a lot of frustration around how to get signed up, just trying to walk into a pharmacy and get the vaccine, and that's not an option. Is there, is that being advertised that people can go into the library for help? Uh, thank you, Ms. Parker, for the question. So it's not being advertised because it's not something we're offering yet. Um, so the purpose of our meeting tomorrow is for us to learn uh, kind of how we can facilitate with that. We're really trying to support the existing infrastructure that exists and the agreements that have been made between the boroughs, staff, and some private um, area businesses. So as soon as we learn um, about uh, that assistance, we will absolutely help get the word out because um, I think it is going to be uh, one of the most significant challenges is helping people who don't have computers, don't have internet access, and also the, the ability to act quickly as soon as those spots become available. We will um, kind of utilize all our networks to help get the word out as soon as we can start helping in that regard. Thank you. And then my other question was about the sports center. I wanted to kind of see how that was going um, now that we've kind of relax restrictions a little bit. And also if you have any update on the Brown Bears, I know we got an email council did about them potentially coming back, scheduling games. I wanted to see if there had been any discussions uh, around that with their management. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, so let's see, I, I know that the ice has been heavily utilized. Uh, one of the first questions I know um, I asked Andrew was once the council had made the change with masking and capacity and things, how are we doing in terms of ice utilization? And it was very full. Um, we're going to be able to schedule a figure skating competition that can fit within those capacity constraints. And so Madeline on our team was really excited to bring that back. Um, and then I know the high school hockey uh, has had a game at, at our facility. And it sounds like the district may be still imposing restrictions tighter than what our 250 would allow. So I have not talked to Andrew since the high school game happened, but um, I think I heard from a parent that they're on, they're on it. They're on top of the, the protocols. So um, we have, uh, I'm going to meet with Andrew on Tuesday and our purpose of that meeting is to talk about summer events, music in the park, Wednesday market, chamber luncheons and conference rooms. Um, so I can get some additional information on how things are going at the sports center and specifically about utilization of the conference rooms as well as some of the other summer events like the sport rec and trade show, uh, the builders show. We're going to try and cover all these topics and this summer I hope that um, we're able to present a plan that's um, much easier. This isn't our first rodeo, this is our second rodeo. So we're going to try and get on top of these things, bring things to the council early, and hopefully have a lot of decisions ironed out ahead of time. All right, thank you. Mr. Carey. Stephanie, I was wondering with the uh, funds that have not yet been used and you're looking at how it might be used, 
would the idea of the voucher program would an idea like that could that also be part of how these funds are used? Uh, thank you, Mr. Carey. That is definitely um, an opportunity moving forward. Um, I had a brief conversation with the chamber director on Friday of last week, just letting her know that I, uh, we were hoping to engage um, with the, the working group, but also with the chamber on ideas moving forward. And I think we've got a lot of exciting ideas. Um, definitely what we want to replicate is the excitement and the momentum that that program generated downtown. So we'll be looking at ideas for helping restaurants get outdoor dining set up. We'll be help looking at um, different grant programs that might be needed in 2021, even if they're a little bit different than what we thought we needed in 2020. So uh, we will welcome any ideas um, from council members and from the community member as we kind of collate them together and then ultimately bring them back to you. Excellent. I just want to say whatever we can do to help the, uh, I'll say the little business person, for many of them, uh, this is what's keeping them here. And without assistance, they will close and be gone. And so whatever you come up with, I know will be wonderful, but particularly focus on those uh, small business owners. Thank you. Any other questions from the council? Ms. Hutchings. I had a question for Stephanie in reference to the 911 call center. Have you had your meeting with the borough yet or is that coming up? We are meeting with the borough tomorrow, tomorrow morning to have that conversation. Um, and it'll be the first time we kind of get together all the experts and uh, different staff in the room. So I imagine I'm going to learn quite a bit. Uh, we have a lot of questions, but really that'll be the, the start of these conversations back and forth. Really this last week, last couple of weeks, um, we've met internally several times, but we're researching things, gathering some additional information and, and plan to meet with, with the borough mayor and his team tomorrow. And who all uses that call center? Soldat? No, the state troopers, anybody else? Uh, thank you, Ms. Hutchins. So there's actually, um, there's several agencies, 16 or 17 that get dispatched through that call center, but the majority of the calls uh, come from the Alaska state troopers. Uh, and then second would be the city of Saldana police. And then CES is third. Those, those agencies make up the vast majority of all calls for service. And then there's other agencies, whether they're uh, fire service areas or um, Alaska State Parks. There's a couple of federal agencies, Fish and Wildlife, that might have occasional calls routed through that center. They make up a very small percentage. Really, the big three, the big two are the state troopers in the city of Saldana, and then third would be CES. So in other words, when you finally have that meeting, you'll be able to get a spreadsheet to see who is being allocated what so it's on an equal footing, so to speak? Yeah, definitely. Um, the, this is a longstanding conversation that different city administrations have had with borough administrations. And the idea of kind of working collaboratively to identify a fair cost allocation has been something, it's not a new idea. So um, we have an opportunity to do that again and potentially look at a cost sharing uh, mechanism that feels fair to all of those, all of those benefactors of that of that center. And then let me ask you one other thing. If we decided not to participate, how many employees would that um, be that we would have to hire to handle our own 911? Will that be something that you will be presenting when you get all your figures? Uh, thank you for that question. I have not worked that out yet, um, but that's something that I definitely could. So uh, some of the cities in the borough do their own 911 dispatching. Kenai is an example of that. Our partnership with the borough and the state has been long, long-standing. Um, it's not, it's not something that I've worked up. So that if if we get to um, that conversation later on and, and work up that as a backup plan, I'd be happy to present that information. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the council? Vice Mayor Parker. Uh, thank you. As a, a follow up to Council Member Hutchins. Um, have we heard, I believe I recall reading an article where the governor has decided to not relocate the troopers from here and, and put everything in Palmer. Is that still the status of relocation of troopers in 911 from here? Uh, thank you, Ms. Parker, for that question. I had not seen an article, but I, I will go look to see if the governor had definitive with that statement. I do know that the the working group that was put together had completed their report. They had identified significant hurdles and challenges 
um, and request for additional information. Um, I do not believe that uh, that project is moving quickly. So we'll be we'll be having conversations with the borough and how the status of their conversations with the state is going to be a large component of what happens at the Soldotna Center um, starting in July and moving forward. Any other questions? Uh, seeing none, I just wanted to add one thing I forgot to mention during my report is um, Project Homeless Connect uh, will be starting there about a week long um, group meetings around the communities um, uh, starting I believe tomorrow or Friday I'm not sure which day but uh, it'll be very active for about the next week that they'll be working on that project homeless connect so uh, moving along to item 11 on the agenda public comments uh, members of the public will have three minutes to comment is there anyone from the public who wishes to comment for those participating through zoom please raise your hand if you would like to comment App users by pressing the raise your hand button and phone participants by dialing star nine on your telephone. And I see no hands raised. So we'll move on to item number 12, council comments. Mr. Carey. On mute. <laughs> on mute. Thank you very much. Thank you. For a particular part of the city to uh, get an excellent rating every year, it can become pretty not out of the ordinary. The work done by our finance department, a clean audit with all the things that have been going on, all the, um, the changes uh, in funds. I just want to say um, I'm extremely grateful for all people involved with finances, for the manager, for the work that uh, she does to make sure they're doing their job and they're doing a wonderful job. And just, uh, it's really nice to hear year after year after year. There are some communities, no fault of theirs, I'd say, but they'd love to get even one, you know, a report without any findings of correction. And we do it every year and we make it look like that's the norm. It obviously isn't. And so again, just a uh, uh, kudos, kudos to all of the financial people in the city and to the mayor and also uh, to our manager for the work they're doing in leadership. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Mr. Cox. Um, well, right now we are still on AB schedule over at the high school. However, Seward, I know, has gone back to full time and we are hoping to go back to full time once we hit yellow. They're still up in the air. It's We're going all by numbers at this point. Um, but sports, sports have started. We have basketball, hockey, skiing, all still. They're all practicing. They're all doing games. Um, like was mentioned, hockey has been at the sports center, and they've, I think they have another few games this week, actually. Um, and then I know that they have had practices, and the borough has been a little bit more strict with them. They still only allow two people per uh, athlete. And then as far as I know, they still have to wear masks while on the ice. And I'm, I'm not sure that might have changed by now, but I have talked to a few hockey players and they're quite upset, upset about that. Um, basketball, they've been practicing also two people per athlete. Then with skiing, it is as well, but it's a little bit easier since we're all outside. It depends on where we are. Um, all of the games and all of the scores are also posted on our website if you'd like to see. Um, I believe they're recorded live, so you can watch them live. And our website is accessible by the KBBSD website. All the schools have a website there. Um, and then our school, our Stuco is, we're just trying to figure out if we're going to have a prom and if we're not, what we're doing, and then having some Valentine's Day activities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Mr. Ruffridge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I don't have anything to add that hasn't already been said. Um, appreciate, obviously, our uh, city administration and staff for all the work that they've been doing. I said this at the last council meeting, but I will repeat. Uh, I think our Parks and Rec Department, especially this winter in light of all of the uh, things that have been adjusted in our day-to-day -day life have really gone 
uh, out of their way to make uh, accessible uh, things to the community outdoors. And um, I just think that's really great. I got an invitation to the Arc Lake event uh, this week and excited about that and kids and skating and all that is uh, it's just fun. I think it's a cool thing that they're doing. So appreciate their work on that. Thank you, Mr. Rockledge. Ms. Pamela Parker. Thank you. Yeah, to echo what Mr. Rockford said, the um, Parks and Rec Department has just been doing such a wonderful job uh, about getting people outside and enjoying our parks and amenities this winter. It was really nice to go skate on Arc Lake this past weekend and to see a lot of people, which is kind of weird because I feel like we don't often get to see a lot of people anymore. <laughs> so that was a really nice, nice part of the weekend. I'm looking forward to the next, I think, two events that um, they're going to be hosting there as well. And I'm also really looking forward to being able to get back together with the business working group to see how we can better support our businesses or not better because I think we're doing an awesome job, but continue to support them this year. So I'm really looking forward to um, having those discussions on what businesses need and what we as a city can do to continue to help. Thank you. Mr. Cholson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's been said quite a bit tonight, but can't say it enough. Uh, we have an awesome team at the city. You guys do amazing work and we are lucky to have you. Um, again, it, every year we can count reliably on the, uh, the financial process going smoothly because of the work that goes in and there is so much work that goes into that. Uh, second, I just want to say thanks to the uh, Parks and Rec Department and uh, their partnership with Change for the Kenai for the chalkboard that went up at the uh, Saldana Creek Park. I thought that was really, really creative. And I, I think our community needs more things like that that can help foster more, uh, more inspiration in the community. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Cholson. Ms. Hutchings. Well, I just wanted to say thank you to this, all of the staff of the city of Soldotna. They do a remarkable job. And I also wanted to uh, comment on the fact of how many people have come to me and said, I can't believe these other cities didn't do what Soldotna did when it came to shop local. So I'm, I'm excited to hear that we might be going ahead and extending that later on in the, uh, in 2021. So thank you to all of you for the great job that you do. Thank you, Ms. Hutching. Vice Mayor Parker. Uh, thank you, Mayor Whitney. A uh, couple things. One, with respect to COVID testing, um, I know that there were a couple of um, events held this past weekend to get vaccines in for folks. And um, I even had a call from my medical practice saying, uh, have you gotten your vaccine? We've got a spot open. Can you come? So. Um, there is a, a network that's already working that and in place. And um, I think here in smaller communities, it's, it's easier to, to, to get a vaccine than it is in the, in the larger communities. But it, it was a, I was shocked when I got a call from my doctor's office and they said, oh, we have an opening for, to get a vaccine. Can you come in? And I said, I've already gotten my first vaccine, but thank you so much for your call. Um, so with respect to roads, I don't live in the main part of town, but I can say where I live, the city has done a, a very good job of, of plowing um, and as well as sanding here. Um, driving in town on the city streets, I hear what you say, Mayor Whitney, with respect to the bumps and, you know, <laughs> it was Saturday and it had to snow because, and snow a lot because it was Saturday. And that seems to have been the practice for the last year. Uh, we get heavy snowfalls on the weekends. Um, I want to congratulate Quinn Cox. Quinn, you've had a, a great, great ski season so far. Congratulations. And um, so high stars I see are, are doing well in cross country this year. And I, I did notice too in the newspaper, um, there were pictures of both Kena and Sohai basketball games. And if you look at the pictures, the basketball players are wearing masks. So, um, you know, I know, I know it's very hot as they run up and down the court, but uh, school district requirement at this point. And then lastly, um, for those who are interested, uh, Alaska Municipal League, we have weekly legislative 
meetings to discuss issues before the legislature that may be of significant impact to local governments around the state. And as those things come up, I will keep you posted. And I, there is a piece I need to run by Stephanie and Andrew that bill that was introduced that might be of interest to the city. So that is all for now, Mayor Whitney. Thank you, Vice Mayor Parker. Move on to item 13 on the uh, agenda, executive session. There is no need for one this evening. Uh, item 14, uh, meeting announcements. Um, February 4th, 2021, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board meeting at 5.30 p.m. And February the 10th, 2021, City Council meeting at 6 p.m. Um, I will be able to attend that. My travel plans have changed. Uh, so I will be here for that meeting. And these meetings will take place in the Soldotna City Hall Council Chambers or by via Zoom. And seeing no other items on the agenda, we are adjourned. Thank you.